show of hands, please, how many of you consider yourselves to be animals? Okay, I'm curious about the few people who didn't raise their hands, because we're all animals here. Humans are animals too, and we're more alike than different. In fact, we share 90% of our DNA with cats. We share 80% of our DNA with cows, and 60% with fruit flies. Despite the fact that we are connected, there is a huge disconnect, and the disconnect is in how the law sees animals, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. The law is a unique change-making tool, and we need to employ it in this area of animals and the law, and I'll tell you why. Sometime in the early history of the Western world, humans appointed themselves to be at the top of a pyramid as the greatest species on Earth, and animals were kicked down to the basement of that pyramid, relegated to other or something, a thing. And in time, the law labeled animals as property. And property is where our problems begin and where legal exploitation starts. So we need to see animals for who they are. Animals are sentient beings. Sentience can simply be described as any time an animal can bear or has the capacity for feelings and experiences. Pain, joy, fear. Spend one minute with an animal and you'll know I'm right. So we need to flip the switch. We need to enact sentience laws to give animals the legal protections they deserve because they are beings with intrinsic worth. So we're in good company in terms of science. As Jane Goodall has said, respect every animal as a sentient being. So if it's good enough for Dr. Goodall, who has spent her life understanding animals, it's good enough for all of us. And to understand this a little bit better, we can think of it a little bit less as human rights and more as human wrongs. We need to be able to take responsibility. When she uses the word um, respect, I see that word as meaning we need to incorporate respect for animals, otherwise it's just a word. We need to put those respect feelings, those respect ideas, and how do we do that? Through our law. Because there have been many disenfranchised groups over the years who've had to come before the law and beg for rights. Women, people of color, slaves. Change takes time, but it is possible. Animals, as one of the last of the disenfranchised groups, it's now their turn. So thinking about Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi said that we can judge nations and their moral progress by the way they treat their animals. And I'm gonna riff off of that a little bit. Oh, for one sec, forgot. My little surprise slide was, animals are not toasters. <laughs> because it's true, animals are not commodities. The moral progress and evolution of humanity can be judged by its animal sentience laws. So by that measure, that yardstick, we can see that Canada gets a failing grade because we do not have sentience laws for animals, and we need to. And the justifications for keeping animals locked in the property cage at the bottom of that pyramid are weak because corporations, they have legal entitlements, some rivers, some holy books, they have legal entitlements. Indeed, why not animals? So it's time, it's time to consider animals. The other important factor is to consider that animals, humans, and the earth are all connected. We are all inextric inextricably connected. In fact, to the point where even if you don't wanna be connected, you are. We are all on this one planet together. There is no planet B. So when we think of it this way, we think there's a wonderful concept in indigenous knowledge, all my relations, and that idea is of the, the interlinking, the respect and reciprocity amongst humans, animals, and the earth. And that's something that we need to have embedded into our sentience laws. It will really help us to get there. In fact, retired senator and jurist, the um, Honorable Murray Sinclair said, we are connected to each other. We know that animals are sentient, yet they are legally marginalized. So when he was a senator, Murray Sinclair incorporated all my relations into the preamble of a game-changing animal law bill called the Jane Goodall Act. 
So it can happen that we can see some shifts starting to happen and some understanding. In the Western concept of all my relations, it can be seen as one health, one world, one welfare. And we can bear this in mind because our very survival may just depend on how we treat animals. Inspiration for my animal law mandate comes from my childhood, way back, in fact, infancy. I was born near the Serengeti in Africa, and this imbued me with a lifelong sense of love and kinship for animals. My love of law came from my lawyer father, who used to tell me bedtime stories based on real cases and put animals in instead of the humans as the legal parties. By the age of four, I had started a little cat club with my friends where we would pad around in the grass with our animals. It wasn't a sophisticated club by any means, but that wasn't the aim. It was just that we as kids saw animals as kin, not as them and us. It was just a connection that we naturally formed. And some of you who are lucky enough to have animals in your lives may remember that from your own childhood. By the year 2000, I had started practicing animal law. And I started to look around and say, well, where are the laws protecting animals? Where are they? And I couldn't find any, or I could find very few. And to this day, I still can't find them, because they're not there. We need to flip the switch. We need to change that up. Animals are sentient beings. They deserve to be considered for their well-being under our laws. So some of what I'm sharing today is coming from my long-term practice in animal law. And let me just describe what animal law is for anybody who might not know it. It is basically any time an animal and the law intersect or clash. So it can be captive animals, wild animals, and it can be domestic animals like cats and dogs. And so my mandate started with the idea of my practice. Then it spread out to teaching, and I teach animal law at two universities. And then I wrote a textbook, Canadian Animal Law. And when I was doing my research for the book, I came across a dusty old law book written in 1900. And I looked at it, and I thought, wow, is this actually, does this have anything to do with animals? We might as well just call this book from 1900 property law because that's what it was all about. It was just talking about animals as automatons, as things. So I was sitting there thinking kind of critically about that author from 1900, and then I thought, hang on. How far haven't we come? We are still talking about animals as property. I was listening to the Dalai Lama speak in the Orpheum Theater in Vancouver many years ago, and I wanted to figure out a way that I could channel the empathy I was learning in the room along with my animal law practice, and try to create sentient stewards for the furry, fluked, and winged out of elementary school kids. So I started a program called Paws of Empathy. And I go into schools, and I teach with dogs. And the lesson one is legal treatment of animals. The legal treatment of animals is, yep, animals can be legally skinned for their fur. Animals can be legally grown and eaten by humans. Animals can legally be locked up in cages. People can charge money for them if they have zoo licenses. And all, I go through a long list of all the things humans can do to, to animals. And the kids are nodding along, you know, groups of 9 to 12 year olds, they're nodding. And then I say, hang on. What if your golden retriever or your calico cat was put into any of those perilous situations? And the kids are outraged. They absolutely hit the ceiling because they feel it. It's close to home when you start talking about their own furry family members. That's when we really feel it. And they say, Victoria, it's terrible. Humans are bullies using the law. Why are they so mean? Why don't animals have laws? And I'm like, why indeed, right? The other reason why I love having dogs in the classroom, aside from the fun factor, is to be able to show students the connection between humans and animals so that we can talk about coexistence. We can talk maybe even about co-flourishing. You know, and we talk about urban wildlife. And the number one thing that I tell students is, your aim here is to really leave them alone. Don't feed them. So students walk out of the classroom that day and they're saying, yeah, you know it's not Disney. Yeah, you know we should leave them alone. You know it's illegal. 
and they start teaching each other. They hear all the things that I've said, and then they repeat it back. So students are very quick studies. Give them a concrete example of dogs. So your beloved family member at home, your dog. Well, it's when they get into court, their property. So what happens here is there can be a very quick escalation for a dog who has bitten or scratched somebody to be put onto death row. But this killing of animals isn't solving anything. In fact, it's just making everything worse. Why should an animal lose their life because we have labels like dangerous dog? We're not getting to the root of the problem. This eye for an eye mentality is failing everybody. We recently had a chance to take a death row dog case all the way up to Canada's top court, the Supreme Court of Canada. We got to argue for the fact that Punky Santix, this dog pictured here, was not property. He was somebody's family member. And this case garnered national and international attention for the simple fact that animals matter. The next example I give kids is about farmed animals because farmed animals have it very badly in our laws and billions of them are used every year. Last year alone, 75 billion animals were used globally in the food chain, slaughtered, which is a staggering number, 75 billion. And if you want a more concrete way of looking at it, three cows approximately are killed per person for every Dane. One cow is killed for every New Zealander per year per person. So when you think about that, over a lifetime, that's an incredible amount of animals to be using. And I get it, not everybody wants to stop eating meat. But at some point, it will just become an imperative. The experts are telling us, COVID, climate, they are all going to just bring agricultural factory farming to a grinding halt eventually. It's just gonna happen. So imagine, if you will, for a minute, if sentience laws applied to farmed animals, and maltreatment was disallowed, an enormous amount of suffering would be eradicated from the world. So our last pause of empathy session, we talked about enacting and enforcing laws, because our laws are only as good as the enforcement behind them. We need to make sure we're enforcing the laws once they're written. So we have to respect animals through the laws we were talking about earlier with Jane Goodall. And to do that, we need to get the public and legislators on board one of the suggestions that I have is to say we should appoint a ministry of animals in every nation so that they can help operationalize animal sentience laws. That would be a good idea. Then at the end of the class, I say to students something that always makes them chuckle. I say, listen, we are aiming for a more legal and equitable framework for animals. What we are not trying to do, we are not trying to give dogs driver's licenses. We're not trying to do that or have giraffes operate heavy machinery. That is not what we're aiming for. We're aiming for a legal framework so that all beings can co-flourish. So the very last day of Pause of Empathy, students come up and they tell me what they've learned. And I hear some amazingly funny things. One student came up to me and he said, thank you, Victoria. I know all animals are sentient. So when I go home tonight, I'm not gonna punch my brother as much. <laughs> and I'm going to feed my dog extra treats. <laughs> Another kid says, Victoria, I am going to donate my birthday money to a farmed animal sanctuary. And a third kid said, Victoria, thank you. I have learned to understand all animals are sentient, except mosquitoes. <laughs> Result. So humans are not always failing animals. We have instances where courts and legislators are slowly and cautiously approaching the idea of animals as more than property. It's slow, but there are pockets of it happening. Here are a couple of examples recently. In 2021, the highest court in Alberta, the Alberta Court of Appeals said that animals are sentient beings and not chattels in a dog case. In 2023, we had groundbreaking changes to BC's Family Law Act, seeing pets as family and pet custody cases. In 2020, Canada's first animal law pro bono clinic, we opened this clinic because access to justice includes animals, but it has a price tag. In 2015, in Quebec, animals are not things, they are sentient beings adopted into law. So we have pockets of this happening, but we need this notion of animals as sentient beings embedded into our laws to catch fire on a global basis, not just a local basis. 
We have a few animal sentience laws already enacted from Austria to Chile. They are only as good as they are enforced, and we need them to spread to become a global success. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We have a window of opportunity here in which to act in which to become the generation that brings an end to labeling animals as mere property. We can walk through that window and become those people. And it's more urgent than you might think. Renowned Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson said, 30,000 species go extinct every year due to human activity. So that means while we've been gathered here for two hours, we may have lost six species. I don't want to live in that world. You don't want to live in that world. It is within our power to change that. So we need to do better. And it's not just going to be legal beagles calling for this change. It's going to be you. It's going to be everybody. I'm going to call on you all to be sentient stewards and to go out there and vote for politicians who want to enact sentience laws, to adopt Don't Shop for Animals, shun foie gras. There is so much you can do on a local level if you put your mind to it. And that's what we're all going to need to do together so that we can co-flourish and have a sustainable future. It's within our own hands. So if you're still looking for a sign that it's time to enact sentience laws, here's a couple. I invite you now to stomp your feet with me if you agree we need sentience laws. <laughs> so our journeys begin and they end with love. To love animals is to love yourself. We are all interconnected. We are all needing to rely on one another. And sentience laws bring us closer together and also provide us with a chance of a sustainable future where we can all co-flourish in this biodiverse world. I'll leave you with this one thought. Animals are someone, not something. And sentience laws operationalize this. It's time to remove animals from their property cage and put them onto the sentient stage. Thank you. <laughs>